November 24th. It's my dad's anniversary today. It's his wow. anniversary. Matt's first wedding that he performed was in yeah. our palace yeah. five years ago. Yeah. Happy anniversary, Daddy. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, breathing tonight, which I need to do. No, it's my neck. Right? <laughs> I'm just going to breathe. So that's the title is Just Breathe. Amen. <laughs> and if y'all remember, um, there was a Faith Hill song, Just Breathe, sweet song. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's it. That, that's a good song. So I looked at the lyrics, and um, it's a little too intimate for a pulpit preaching. So if y'all were at the ladies' meeting, we, we talked on some intimacy with God, but we're not going to go there tonight. So we're going to talk about breath. Um, we're going to talk about the first breath, first of all. Let's we'll start with the first breath that came from God. Our first breath came from God. So let's turn to Genesis 2. Okay, Genesis 2, 7. Where am I? The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So he took the dust, which was something ordinary, and he breathed. That word is um, a forceful kindling. And that gives you, that's like such rich imagery to me. That, that's really neat. A forceful kindling. He breathed the breath of life, and the breath that he breathed with force was divine inspiration. A couple weeks ago, Eric taught on respiration, breathing, re-spiriting re yourself. Um, inspiration is that same root word, it's got that S-P-I-R in it. And when we think of inspiration, you know, you see someone do something godly that inspires you to do good work. Um, when God breathed that breath, it was divine inspiration. And it's not only you're influencing somebody, but it's also to infuse life by breathing. Amen. And that's a pretty neat definition of inspiration. Now, when you think someone inspired me, they infused life by breathing, by being near me, and I saw what they were doing. Yeah. <clears throat> so that was the first breath, and that breath gave us life. Mm -hmm. um, tonight, Mike was blowing through the shofar horn, and I started to think about that and how that's the breath of God commanding his troops, right? He's, he's calling us to attention. And the reason why he uses that, I believe, is because it's familiar to us. That breath gave us life, so it's a call to us to go out and, and tell others about that life that he gave us, to change their lives, too. So I just thought that was really neat yes, when, um, when he was blowing that. The Lord showed me that. Um, we're, okay, you got the thing? I want to show y'all something neat. Um, y'all know I'm a mom. And have four kids. <laughs> yeah. There's something really neat. I mean, pregnancy is a miracle. We tried for years to have babies, and we're very unsuccessful, and then we're very, very successful. <laughs> so we know a lot about the intricacies of pregnancy and what it takes and um, all the miracles. We all, can you all see that? Yeah. Yeah. That, that one doesn't work. We'll um, so there, there's something neat that happens with a baby's heart. And I'm not going to go into too many details. I love science, but some of y'all probably don't love science. So I know Mr. Fred is a scientific man. Um, but I'm not, I'm not going to get too detailed for y'all. But basically, this is what a heart looks like, a normal heart that's feeding in our chest right now. Okay? And I'm going to mouse over. Y'all can see. We've got four chambers. Oh, what did I do? Uh -oh. Just scroll down. There you go. Okay, so we've got four chambers. This one, there's one, two, three, four. Y'all see that? Yes. Okay, we need that for our life. The blood that is lacking oxygen in our body comes in through these um, vessels right here, goes into these chambers, and goes out through this pulmonary artery to our lungs to pick up oxygen. Okay, then when it comes back from this little red one over here and this little red one over here, and it's got oxygen, that's why it's red. It comes into here and then it gets pumped to the rest of our body. Now follow me, you right with me? Okay, so that's what we need. Well, when a baby is growing in its mother's womb, it's not using its lungs. It's getting oxygen from its mama, huh? Alicia, <laughs> she's, she's struggling back there to yeah. breathe. She's trying to make some room so the baby can breathe, right? Okay, so God designed a baby's heart really neat so that, um, 
it, it kind of the blood the blood flow the blood cycle kind of bypasses the lungs so check this out this is what a baby's heart does now you see the little thing that says foramen oval I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly I'm not medical but okay where that little the, the arrow on the left there's a hole that's supposed to be there between these two chambers and what that does is as the blood is coming from the placenta it already has oxygen so it doesn't need to go to the lungs so it bypasses that whole system and just goes to the main pumping um, chamber to pump into the rest of the body now if you look up at the top where it says ductus arteriosus that's another little valve where if some of the blood does go down into that other chamber like it's going to go to the lungs and go pick up some oxygen it actually it's like a little escape hatch and the blood actually goes through that and goes to the rest of the body so we're just bypassing the lungs altogether okay so this is what's really neat <clears throat> when a baby is born and the reason why doctors are so aggressive with babies you've seen them they slap the babies they rough them rough them up real good you know you've had a couple <laughs> they rough them up real good and you're like oh no it's my newborn baby but they're trying to stimulate it to take that deep first breath when that first breath enters that lung in enters their lungs there's some pressure there and that pressure causes that foramen ovale <laughs> to close in that moment in the moment of the first breath it closes it seals so the blood flows where it's supposed to and then the little ductus arteriosus up here it closes within a few days it closes and shrivels up and just becomes like a ligament just to hold things up just becomes a structure so this is before this is what it looks like after you see the difference there's a change in the heart when that first breath enters that resonates with me. That, that's what happened. Didn't that happen to you when God breathed on you that first time? You had a change of heart. The forcefulness of his presence entering you changed your heart. It changed your system. It changed what you were attached to. When you're in the womb, let's just um, let's play this little imagery out here. When you're in the womb and you're attached to that umbilical cord, you have no choice to breathe or not to breathe. That's just the way things are. You were just made that way you're receiving your, your nutrition your oxygen all that from that blood vessel and you can't help but be a baby that's just what you are so when we're in the world we can't help but sin that's just the way we are that's the way we were made we inherited the sinful nature um, natalie asked me the other day we were doing homeschool and we were reading about spanish conquistadors and how they came in and they just took over and they took land and claimed it in the name of spain and she just with these wide eyes why would they do that <laughs> Why would they kill these people? Why would they take their stuff? It's not right. So, well, baby, if you don't have a reason to be right, to be good, then you're not going to be because we're all sinful. This is just the way we are. And she, she's just having a hard time with this. Like, people are just sinful. That's the state in our house. We're hopefully mostly godly. But outside in the world, people are sinful, and that's hard for her to grasp. So that's the old system, right? We're, we're just attached to that Mother Earth. We're attached to the world system. Um, but then when God breathes into us, we get changed over. And now we're not dependent on the Mother anymore. We're dependent on the air. We're dependent on His breath to be with us. We can turn this off. Um, let's go to Ephesians 2. There. Okay. So this is how we were. This is our other system. Ephesians 2 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit or the breath that is at work in those who are disobedient. So that was, my, that was my breath. He was at work in me. I was pretty disobedient. That's bad breath. <laughs> I was dead in my transgressions. I felt like I was walking around dead. I felt like I had nothing to live for. Um, <clears throat> I even felt like I was going to die. I thought, this is the end of my life. And 
I said that like on a Monday or Tuesday, and on that Friday I got born again. So I really did die. <laughs> it really did happen that way. Hallelujah. Buried her. Um, let's turn over to Jeremiah. I think Miss Angie shared this with us at one lady's retreat. There. Jeremiah 30. There. There. Not there. <laughs> there. 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 When I read this, this just really resonated with me because this is this is how I felt there. about myself. And I know he's talking to Israel, but he's talking to me too. Um, Jeremiah 30, 12. This is what the Lord says. Your wound is incurable, your injury beyond healing. There is no one to plead your cause, no remedy for your sore, no healing for you. All your allies, all your drinking buddies, all your drug buddies have forgotten you. They care nothing for you. I have struck you as an enemy would and punished you as the cruel because your guilt is so great and your sins so many. Why do you cry out over your wound, your pain that has no cure? Why is this happening to me? Well, why, why do you think? Because of your great guilt and many sins, I have done these things to you. Um, in Ephesians, it says we were objects of his wrath. When we were in that world system, we're objects of his wrath. No wonder. No wonder those things occurred. Let's turn to Psalm 34. This is our hope, though. This is one of my husband's favorite songs. He wrote a song from it recently. There. Well, we're going to skip there. that part, baby, because you preach that in worship. <laughs> okay, 3417. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. This is the part. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. So why would he want you to be brokenhearted? Why, why would the Lord, I mean, doesn't he want good things for you? Why would he be close to you when you're brokenhearted? Because as a participant in the world system, the end result is always going to be a broken heart. And when you finally realize and you, you allow your spirit to be crushed by the weight of the things that you've done, that's when the Lord can breathe on you. That's the moment when you can receive him. When I realized that my efforts weren't good enough, um, my struggles to stop doing the things <coughs> I was doing, um, they weren't good enough. And I was crushed by the weight of it. I thought, God, no, one's, no one even cares. No one even cares that I'm drowning here. I hate, I hate who I am. I hate what I've done. And there's... I don't know a way out. I don't have a plan. I'm just, I'm, I just will wake up tomorrow and find a fix and go on from there. I don't know. I don't know what to do. And um, it crushes you. That, that way finally gets to a point where it crushes you. And some of you, it doesn't take very much, and you turn to the Lord. And But some of you, if you're like me, Matt calls it the two-by-four ministry. <laughs> and that two-by-four upside your head <laughs> gets your attention. It's like I needed to sin enough, I guess before I felt truly crushed. Um, okay, so that's a one-time thing, right? That God breathes on you, you're changed, one-time thing, we're good to go. We just go on from there, right? That's what most, that's what, most, that's what Eric preaches for me. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> God and all. But, see, we're not listening. No. <laughs> not at all. It's just like a baby. If the baby wants to continue to live, he must what? Continue to breathe. breathe yeah. Right? It's a, all day, even when you're sleeping, you got to breathe. <clears throat> so how do we do that? What What is breath? Let's talk about respiration. I'm going to get a little scientific on you a little bit. Um, we need oxygen, basically. Our bodies need oxygen to produce energy. So let's look at that in the light of our spiritual sense, okay, our spiritual um, walk with God. Um, oxygen in our body combines with glucose, which comes from food, okay? So the Word says that the Word is food, right? God's Word is food, and His breath, His presence, combine together, produce energy in us. They also produce another thing. They also produce 
there's a byproduct that occurs, it's carbon dioxide. Um, so let's just pretend, for the sake of example, that oxygen is the good things from God. It's the, um, the result of being in his presence, by having his spirit dwell within us. When we breathe him in, we're inviting him in, and so that oxygen comes in and it gives life to our bodies to go and do the things he's called us to do. Okay, well the carbon dioxide in this example is bad, right? Carbon dioxide is the stuff that makes bread rise. So we all know yeast sin, right? So let's just, let's go with me, follow me in this. Carbon dioxide is bad and oxygen is good. When you've got your little blood cells running through your body and trying to carry oxygen to all your cells to give them energy. Um, if there's carbon dioxide on that red blood cell, it can only hold so many um, oxygen molecules on it. If there's carbon dioxide on it, it just bullies and pushes that oxygen right out the way. Mm. So if we are living by our sinful nature and we've got all these pride, lust, guilt, envy, anger, rage, yelling at my kids, kicking the dog, <laughs> disrespecting my husband, all that, there's not a whole lot of room for God's oxygen to be there. Mm. So what what is it? Um, what happens if there's too much carbon dioxide in our bodies? Uh, did you know that when you're prompted to breathe, it's not because your oxygen levels are low. You would think, well, wow, if, I'm, if I haven't been reading my word, that, that prompts me to be in his, spirit, in his presence. It's actually the opposite. When there's too much carbon dioxide, when the carbon dioxide levels rise, mm -hmm. it causes you to breathe, okay? So, but what if you hold your breath? What if you say, mm -mm, no, Lord, I just don't want you to touch me right there because that's my little pet and I like it. I like to nurture it, and I want you, you can come over here, but you can't come on this side. So I just hold my breath right there, and those carbon dioxide levels start to rise in my body. So listen to this. If you have carbon dioxide toxicity, see if this rings any bells. These are the symptoms gradually increasing as the carbon dioxide increases in your body. Um, you have dimmed sight. <laughs> can't see very well, right? You have reduced hearing. Wow. Can't hear the Lord <laughs> speaking to you, mm. calling you back to Him. Mm. Drowsiness, mm. laziness. I don't really feel like going to talk to my neighbor. I know he needs it, but I'd rather just watch Grey's Anatomy or something. <laughs> <laughs> Dizziness. Can't walk straight, right? It starts to affect your walk. You start to see it. Confusion. Now you really don't know. You can't discern anything anymore. You've got so much of self and flesh and carnality in you that you're confused. Eventually, you're going to fall out. Unconsciousness. Spiritual death. How many people have you known that's happened to? It's gotten all the way to the point of spiritual death. I have got a good friend in the whole realm. She was a friend in the Lord, who right now is in between that unconscious spiritual death state. It is breaking my heart. And the more I call out to her, the more I reach out to her, the more she stiff arms me, which I'm not taking personally. It's She's doing it to the Holy Spirit. And uh, I'm scared for her. It's like, you need CPR. Wake up. What are you doing? But she has gotten so much of the world in her she can't see straight anymore. That's a scary place to be. Okay, so what is it to breathe God in? Let's get off the scientific stuff. Let's get into the real. How do we breathe God in? Well, if you're going to breathe on somebody, brush your teeth. <laughs> get some gum. No, you have to be face to face, right? Yeah. To have that breath, you have to be face to face. Um, when my kids go to the doctor, they're in a scary situation. They're very nervous. They know they're gonna get a shot and they're freaking out. They're already crying. Sydney, Sydney cries before the nurse even comes in the door. She's freaking out. She's worked herself up. And when I tell her, hey, 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 look, look at me, look at my eyes. Look at me right here, we're right here. It's gonna be okay, hold my hands. Look at me and I, I get her face to face. And when she's focused on me and we're breathing, let's breathe together. I, I do that with my kids. <laughs> this great deep breath. It's like, I don't know, let's distract them. Deep breath. <laughs> okay, breathe it out, and the shot's over with, and everybody's okay. She was focused on me. She wasn't focused on the affliction, the trial, the painfulness that she was going through. <clears throat> when
when you breathe him, when you're face to face, you're breathing in his presence, his essence. Um, I was thinking about this, and Eric actually said this too when we were in the office talking. Um, I was thinking about my daddy, and I got a special relationship with my daddy. I love my daddy. And, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, my daddy was a working man. He still is a working man, but he's one of those men that works hard. You know, he didn't work in an office, and he'd come home, and he'd smell like work. He smelled like metal and sweat and manliness, and that's what I grew up with, you know? That's what he smelled like. That's what my dad smelled like. It wasn't bad. It was a good smell. That's my daddy. And when he'd come home, he walked, worked offshore a lot, so he'd be gone seven days, and then he'd be home for seven days. And when he'd come home after that seven-day absence, and I would climb in his lap, I remember what he smelled like. And that was such a place of comfort for me. I could just breathe him in and know that he was close. And that's how I feel like we can kind of get centered with God. is when we breathe in his presence where we're close enough to him to where we're really smelling him. You ever smell God? You know, like when, when he falls in this room and you just, ooh, he's here. You just smell him. <clears throat> another, another, um, thing about being face to face with God is we sing that song um, I seek the bread of his face and Mike's preached on this several times I know Chris Sims talks a lot about that well I had never asked anybody what bread of your face means I mean it's weird right I mean if we had guests in here and we're singing that song don't you all go Hey, this is weird <laughs> first time Matt sang that song and Natalie looks up at me like what? <laughs> I was supposed to do what to Jesus? <laughs> and I said, ask Daddy. Daddy will tell you. <laughs> Sorry, so. um, I don't know. What is that, Lord? What is that? You know, and so I just start kind of reasoning it with my own mind. You know, I start thinking about it. I'm like, okay, well, if I was face to face with God, then, yeah, I'd be like, I'd be fed by his presence, right? That, that must be what it means. It's being fed by being in his presence. I'm getting that bread, that daily bread. Well, during that, that worship period, I'm thinking all this through and logically tracing it out with the words and all that. The Lord kept giving me this image of my grandmother. <clears throat> and my grandmother, she recently passed away, and um, I had a special relationship with her, too. <laughs> and she, uh, she had a very soft face. She, um, she never used soap on her face all her life. She always used cold cream. <laughs> and so she had a very, very soft face. And the one thing I remember about her is every time I'd go to her house, she'd meet you right there at the door and she'd hug you. And when she'd hug you, you'd get right up next to her face and you'd feel that soft, that soft cheek. And that was just an image. And so during worship that night, the Lord kept bringing that image to my mind and I'd just start weeping, missing my grandmother. And I thought, okay, I mean, I miss her, but Lord, okay, right at the face. Let me get back to <laughs> what are you talking about? And I couldn't get it. I, he was trying to show me later on. Matt's like, you know what that means, huh? You know, it's, where it's when you're right up close enough to God, to Jesus, to feel that soft place on his cheek. It's like, uh -huh. so dense. I mean, Lord, that was so beautiful. I mean, that's what you were showing me, that soft place. So when we, when we breathe him in, when we feel like, okay, there's a little too much of the world creeping in on us. <clears throat> and our carbon dioxide levels start to rise. We start to see that dim sight and that mental confusion coming on us. It's, it's an alert. It's an alert. Run into his presence. Get right up there next to his face. Look him eye to eye. Lord, what is it that you want to, want to say to me? Let me breathe you in. Come inside and change me. Give me what I need to do what you're calling me to do. <clears throat> um, in Ephesians, it says, be being filled with the Spirit. It's a continual thing. It's that breathing. It's in and out. I'm breathing Him in, and I'm expelling that carbon dioxide. I'm breathing Him in, and I'm expelling the waste. Let's go to Romans 15. There. 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 This is good word. Yeah. Okay, 1513. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, 
so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Breath. This is the goal of breathing him in, to be filled with all joy and all peace as we trust him through wherever circumstances are so that you can overflow. Why, or why do we need to overflow? To give to others. Amen. That shofar calls out, and it reminds us this is not just for you. Go breathe on somebody else. <clears throat> Philippians 4 is my second favorite scripture. There. Did I say Philippians? Mm -hmm. yeah. Philippians 4. 4-4. Four, four. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let me stop there. Rejoice. That's that re, right? That means you once had it, now you need to do it again. Rejoice. Refill with his spirit that gives you all joy and peace. Rejoice in the Lord. Refill in him. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious, which means uneasy because of fear. Do not be uneasy because of fear about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now that understanding right there is not God's understanding. That's your own intellect. That's what that word is, your own intellect. That transcends your intellect. I need God's peace to transcend my intellect because I get in the way. <clears throat> Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. When he says put it into practice, do repeatedly. I'm going to practice that one time. Did y'all practice once? <laughs> Even though y'all lost all the time in football. Oh, <laughs> no. You played a good game. <laughs> yeah. You still had to practice, right? It's okay, you can handle it. <laughs> gets mentioned by them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it was, I think Eric was going, right? Y'all had a winning season, right? Yeah. Or, no. yeah, my last one was a winning season. <laughs> 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 so, Philippians 4, 5 and 6. Okay, so what happens if we're not rejoicing? What happens if we're not refilling in God's presence? You think that it just affects you? Turn to Romans 12. There. 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 Romans 12.4 Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So if you have an organ in your body that's not getting oxygen, is it just, if your liver just starts to shrivel up, is it just going to affect the liver? It's going to affect the function of the whole body. So if you are not refilling in God's presence, then you're affecting the function of our whole community. Eric's been talking about that a lot, getting our minds off the individual relationship with Jesus and, and our communal, putting it on the communal relationship with Jesus. We have a function to fulfill. So this is not just in the grand scheme of, of over a lifetime, if Mario does not seek the Lord occasionally, is it going to affect? No. That's today, if I yell at my kids like I did <laughs> and scream and lose my cool and not dwell in his presence and not rejoice and refill, well, it affects all of you. Those little moments affect because I'm not functioning at my highest capacity. First <coughs> Peter 2. There. 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 There.
Peter 2, 1. Therefore rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. That's a lot of carbon dioxide. Yeah. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. So we're not just going to stay newborn babies. We have to grow up in our salvation. So how do we do that? <clears throat> Peter's such a good man. Let's go to 2 Peter. He gives us the answer. Mm -hmm. yeah. 2 Peter 1, 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. We don't just have breath for life. We have his breath for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So this new system that we're operating in, this breath that we're breathing in, this respiratory system, this is the divine nature. This is that divine inspiration that he's given us. Verse 5, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, I know I'm flying through these, and brotherly kindness, love. Okay, when I first read that, it's like, oh yeah, just a bunch of good things, okay. Now, this is kind of, this is a step-by-step. -step. This is... Okay, this is one block. This is your foundation. I'm going to put another block on top of that. I'm going to put another block on top of that. So where do we start? Faith. That's where we start. That's that first breath. That's when you're born again. Okay, but this is not just your salvation experience. Um, in my life, I have issues with anger. I'm still dealing with. I thought I had dealt with them. They're still there. <laughs> so I'm having to breathe life into that area of my life. Um, when the Lord begins to deal with you in a certain area, um, you can apply these steps to that. It's not just about your salvation. It's not just some long-term, grand scheme plan. This is for each individual area that he's breathing life into. Okay, so in faith, that's where we trust him. That's, our, that's the beginning. Okay, we're going to add goodness to that. So goodness is us doing good things. We're um, beginning to walk in new life in this area, right? It's like a toddler just beginning to take steps. So when I got born again, I didn't know what the word said, I didn't know, but I just began to act good because I knew I wanted to be good. So I'm adding to my faith goodness. Now it says to add knowledge. So now we need to find out what pleases the Lord. Okay, so if in anger, uh, I started to not be so angry, not explode so much. <coughs> But I'm going to add knowledge. What does the Lord want to teach me about this? How can I please Him in this struggle? I'm going to I'm going to read my Word. I'm going to devour it. I'm going to add knowledge to my goodness. So once I've got that knowledge, I'm armed with knowledge. When I put it into practice, it becomes self-control. Another word, if some of y'all have King James, it's temperance. And I like that word because um, it speaks to me about like when you temper metal. You heat it up and you cool it and you heat it up and you cool it and you get it to the place where it can endure any circumstance, right? And it stays the same. Its characteristics stay the same, stable. So after we have a little bit of self-control, we need to add perseverance. It is, <laughs> perseverance is cheerful endurance. So when we begin to exhibit these traits, over a time period, cheerfully. Not just, I'm, not, I'm going to bite my tongue and not scream at my head. I'm going to cheerfully endure this for a long time. Then I have perseverance. All of a sudden, I can look back and I say, oh, look at this. <clears throat> so after perseverance, godliness. My actions are starting to look like God now. Amen. And after godliness, there's brotherly kindness. Which that threw me for a loop, honestly, because uh, you would think godliness would be kind of, you know, that would be one of the top echelon of it. 
But on top of that is brotherly kindness. Wouldn't that be like one of the first things? Be nice to your brother. But 1 Peter 1.22 says we need to have sincere love for our brothers. So if my brotherly kindness, if my brotherly love is to be sincere, I kind of need to get myself under control first, right? And on top of all of this, I'm going to add love, which is our, the ultimate goal. It is love is the demonstration of the essence of God, the demonstration that his breath is within me. So if I add all of these things together in increasing measure, let's see verse 8, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. That sounds like carbon dioxide poisoning right there. Um, my last scripture, the last thing I want to say to y'all, Galatians is, is in Galatians 5. There. Okay, 516. This is what a healthy life looks like. A good cardiovascular health with the Lord. So I say live by the spirit or live by the breath. And you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under law. Let's skip down to 22. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, <laughs> faithfulness, gentleness, I need some more gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. We have unplugged our umbilical cord from the sinful nature. Since we live by the Spirit, since we <coughs> live by the breath, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So if I am living by breathing in him, being that face to face, that bread of his face, feeding me every day, then I'm going to start to see these, these things in my life in increasing measure. Cool. Love y'all. <laughs> <laughs> good word. As long as it's 12 minutes, I think it's That is good. Did y'all hear something funny? she couldn't preach. Oh, boy, was she wrong. <laughs> the word that was given to Israelites at Mount Sinai It's come apart and be separate. You know the circumstances under which that were said? Somebody was standing at the foot of God's mountain but still so attached to the world they were worshiping golden calves. And God told his priest, strap your sword on your side. Go strike down your brothers. That's a very strange thing. It's the only time the Levites ever wore swords in the Bible. And God warned. He said, come apart and be separate from them. He said, this day I've set you apart. When his breath enters you, it's like cutting up the umbilical cord. You have to come apart and be separate. Because that carbon dioxide is going to kill you. It's going to kill you. We find life in his every breath that he speaks with us. So a housewife who loves the Lord can see God at work in a child's doctor visit. Right? This is God. This is the creation speaking of the glory of God does. It's not a beautiful sunset. It's that in everything that you do, you see God at work. Amen. This is the minor prophets that say the glory of God covers the earth as water covers the sea. I just want to encourage you. We've got from now until Sunday till you see us again, unless you're coming to gorge yourself at my house. Find the things that you can feel God breathing and distance yourself from the things that you don't feel. Okay. 
And maybe the point that I took the most of, it's not oxygen that makes you take a breath. It's carbon dioxide that makes you take a breath. Yeah. So if your life is full of yucky things, don't think that separates you from God. It illustrates your need for Him. Right. Come on now. When He first breathed in you, you were so full of carbon dioxide that there wouldn't be room for breath and He forced His way in. I love y'all. I love that. Isn't that fun? Isn't it good to hear other people preach? Yeah. Don't be careful. <laughs> I really enjoy it. You know, we want that. We, I wish that all God's people were prophets. I'm proud of her. Why, why don't y'all stand your feet? We're going to pray for her and for you. to be first <laughs> disregarded it <laughs> I want to encourage you with all of our first that we talk about like are you there mm -hmm. are you there there and we love to be first with it let's never let that fall off the point of the speaker I, I don't think that would be pleasing to Jesus I began that whole thing because I wanted the congregation to track with the speaker and the speaker to track with the congregation never wanted that to be a distraction though. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So uh, let's take that right in stride and breathe that one in. Mm -hmm. she, she had a good word. Yeah. 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 Didn't she? Yeah. 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 Let's pray. Mighty, mighty God, <coughs> though we breathe your presence, mm -hmm. you are amazing. You brought the people here tonight that you wanted to hear this message. They thought they chose to come, but you chose for them to come. Lord God, you raised up a woman to give this message. She thought it was her idea, and it turned out to be your idea. She thought she was incapable, and you showed her you are capable. Lord, we thank you for these things that are teaching us every day, that you care for widows and orphans, that you care for those whose lives are full of carbon dioxide, and we just need your breath. Lord, I pray that this word would settle in our hearts in a way that it becomes part of our fabric. In the name of Jesus, we pray.